Well, we're going to undertake a review of the epistles of Peter. And I think there isn't any person that's more colorful, uh, more endeared to most of us, than this interesting character that goes by the name of Simon or Peter. And an interesting guy in many ways. And uh, so that's, that's our undertaking. Is to, he wrote two letters. We're going to take 1 Peter chapter 1. As a, it will start as an introduction. I don't expect to get through this whole chapter this time. It's one of the lengthier chapters in his letter. His original name was in Hebrew, Simeon, or Simon as it's sometimes rendered. And uh, that's the way you see it in the New Testament. A Greek name of similar sound to Simeon. His father's name was Jonah. He was Simon Bar Jonah, son of Jonah. And uh, so he, he was married. We, ne- we learned from Mark 1. And uh, in his missionary days, at least, his wife accompanied him. Because we find occasional references there. His place of origin was Bethsaida, on the northern shore, in fact, almost the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. But it was primarily a Greek city, interestingly enough. It's over on that east side. But he also had a a home in Capernaum, in Galilee. That's also uh, uh, on the northern shore of the so-called Sea of Galilee. It's really a lake, but everybody calls it the Sea of Galilee. And uh, Capernaum had his synagogue and his home there. Uh, And uh, it has been uh, excavated what we believe was his home that grew to become a meeting place, uh, an auditorium of sorts. And so uh, he spoke Aramaic with a strong North Country accent, we learn from Mark 14. And he maintained the piety and the outlook of his people. So even though he was a fisherman, he was uh, apparently a dedicated Jewish observer. And, uh, but he was not trained in the law specifically, but his uh, literacy is not in question. He's obviously very literate, especially after, his, uh, after the Holy Spirit, after Acts chapter 2. In fact, it's a fascinating contrast to study Peter's discussions and, and uh, verbal involvements in the, in the Gospels with the remarkable articulation and craftsmanship in his two sermons and acts, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3, and following, very skilled, a real evidence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's his, his brother, Andrew, was a disciple of John the Baptist, so it's likely that uh, Peter also may have been influenced by John the Baptist's ministry prior to uh, some of the things that we'll read about here. So... He was a fisherman in the Sea of Galilee. And it's interesting that you can actually uh, visit and see and examine a boat like the one that was prevalent in his day fishing at a a, uh, kibbutz, Nof Genesar. That's a kibbutz right on the Galilee there on the northwest corner. In about 1985 and 86, there was a drought, very drastic drought. The Sea of Galilee was lower than it had been in, in for many, many, many years, and in the mud, in the low, in the low, uh, with the low uh, water line, a 26-foot boat, about a seven-foot beam, was discovered in the mud, and very skillfully. Fortunately, they contacted the right experts, and they found a way to preserve it by uh, replacing it with, with the, the polyurethane and so forth. And so they went through a very extended process to carefully remove and preserve this uh, boat. And uh, carbon-14 dating of the boat gave a date somewhere between 60 B.C. and 60 A.D. So it certainly embraces the period in which we have so much uh, recording in the Gospels of the fishermen on Galilee. So... It's not necessarily his specific boat. We have no way of knowing that. But it was a very skillfully crafted and very carefully, uh, frequently repaired boat that uh, was obviously uh, very dear uh, to its owner back then and gives us some grasp. In the Gospels, we read of Jesus sleeping on that boat with his head on a pillow. The actual term is really for a sandbag they used for trimming the boat, by the way. But anyway, getting back to the Gospels, the fourth Gospel, the Gospel we know is the Gospel of, uh, of uh, John, describes a period of, of Christ's activity before the commencement of the Galilean ministry. And uh, this may be referred to 
uh, it, Peter's first introduction to him by Andrew's agency, because Andrew introduces him to Christ. And uh, his, his, he had been met, introduced to Christ earlier, but he was then called by the lakeside in Mark chapter 1, and then subsequently called to the intimate band of the twelve. So there's two s steps there that often cause some confusion. An initial introduction, then a call to be a follower, and then to be a member of the twelve. Those are each individual steps in Mark 1 and Mark 3 and so on. It was as a disciple, not just a follower, but a disciple, that Simon received his new title, a new name. In the Aramaic, Kepha, or Cephas, if you will, as rendered by some, which means rock or stone. So that's like a nickname or an epithet, uh, a nickname as we would use it today. It's usually used in the New Testament in the Greek form as Petros. And this term was given to him earlier, but also it gives rise to a lot of confusion of what occurs at Caesarea Philippi, which we'll explore. Jesus confirmed, conferred this title of Cephas, or Kepha. Um, uh, it, was, it was not known as a personal name previously, but he, at, his fir at their first encounter, John chapter 1, verse 42, Jesus calls him uh, the rock or a stone, Cephas. And, but when you get to Matthew 16, we have an encounter at Caesarea Philippi. That's way up in the north. They're up there, and when Jesus came into the... This is recorded in Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, that Jesus says unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Key question. Key question for each of us. Who do you think Christ is? You know, we've all been beneficiaries of this marvelous film that Mel Gibson did called The Passion. A remarkable piece of, of uh, cinematography, and yet it fails in a couple of places. One of the primary ways it fails, it doesn't get across who he really is. And your answer to that question will determine your, etern your eternity. So he's, Jesus here is confronting his, his disciples. Okay, that's what they say. Whom say ye that I am? And this is one of Peter's finest moments. Because then Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. In the International Standard Version Bible, they'll, they'll, they're gonna, they don't use the word Christ at all. They use the word Messiah, more definitive. The word Christ is just the Greek term for Messiah. When we, so, St. Peter answered and said, Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Wow. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Simon Barjona, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now this is a verse that has caused a lot of confusion and misunderstanding by not understanding the play on words that Jesus is indulging here. And I'll get back to that. But then he, he mentioned something else. He said, I will give unto thee the, king, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall also be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of groups, cult groups and others, have built all kinds of uh, 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 concepts on this one verse. And I'm not going to go into all of that here, but it's one that deserves very careful study on your own part. When you get into the kingdom of heaven, what does it really mean? And what are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? The answer to that actually is in Isaiah 22, verse 22, but we're not going to get into that here. Let's continue here, though. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Wow. 
I thought we we're supposed to go out and declare that. Indeed, we are. But here at this time, not yet. And from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Jesus would know that for a number of reasons, not the least of which it was all prophesied in the scriptures. You can find this in the ninth chapter of Daniel, and you can find this, uh, you can find the description uh, that is so detailed of the crucifixion that American Management Associ uh, Medical Association has in their journal, they have articles describing the cause of death from the details that are described, described in Psalm 22 that was written 700 years before crucifixion was even invented. Anyway, but Jesus is explaining that that's all coming. He knew it was coming, and he, he explained it to him. Did they understand it? No. The guys didn't. They're confused. They remembered him saying that later, but they didn't understand at the time. The only, only a couple of the gals picked up on this later, we pick up. In fact, then Peter took him. He, ha he just had his finest moment, didn't he? And right on the heels of that, Peter took him and said, began to rebuke him. He's rebuking his Lord? Get serious here. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord. <laughs> this shall not be unto thee. Now we smile at Peter's um, presumption here. But we do the same thing. How often do we kneel in prayer and give God our want list? Huh? Suggestion to God what needs to be done to straighten things out. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Boy, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And I'm sure that would confuse them at the time. This is Matthew 16. The cross? What are you talking about? The cross. Well, in ten chapters later, they will understand. He says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is it man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what shall it man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he, then he shall reward every man according to his works. The rewards according to their works. Verily I say unto you, there, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Many people don't understand that closing verse. The next verse in Matthew is chapter 17, verse 1, the transfiguration. That's what he's alluding to. He's not saying that his second coming is going to be during the lifetime. No, no, no. There are some of you standing here, and there were three of them that were standing there, shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So we'll get to that a little bit more later. But what is Jesus really saying at Caesarea Philippi to Peter and the gang? He says, Thou art a little stone, Peter, but upon this big rock I will build my church. He's not pointing, you know, Petros is a little stone. Petra is a large rock. There's no definite article before the Petra. There is a definite, there's, excuse me, the definite article is used before Petra. There's no definite article used before Petros. Also, Jesus says, I will build. Not the disciples, not the missionaries. Jesus, I will build the, my church. And I will build. That's future tense. He's going to do that in the future. He's not doing it yet at the time he's saying this. And what is the foundation here? Is the foundation this confession of Peter? Some people teach that. Is the foundation Peter himself? There's a play on words here because of Petra, Petros, and so forth. Some people will build on that. Third possibility is that the foundation is what? Christ himself. And that is confirmed throughout the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 10.4, the rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11 makes the same point. Ephesians 2, verse 19 through 23. Hammers that through, the, ro the rock. There is no other foundation that can be laid but that Christ... It's all about Jesus. 
Now, John's usual designation in his gospel is Simon Peter. Mark calls him Simon up to chapter 3, verse 16, and Peter almost invariably thereafter. And some people make the case that when he's referring to a Simon, you're referring to the natural man. When you're referring to the title that Jesus gave him, Petra, Petros, I should say, uh, that's the born-again Peter. There's nothing in any case to suggest that the solemn words of Matthew 16, 18 represented the first bestowal of the name. Some people think that that's where he named him Peter. No, he gave him that name earlier. He's just using a play on words there in, in, in uh, Matthew 16, verse 18. Now, this incident is widely confused by many teachers of what happened to Caesarea, how to use that phrase from Caesarea Philippi. It is explained better for us as we get into Peter's letters. He'll point out that he was, he in effect, is putting to silence this idea that he was the first pope, that he was the leader of the early church. Not true. And he so claims it's not true. If you just look at his letters. So we'll unravel that as we go through his two letters that we're going to undertake study here. If you think of all of Jesus' followers as a group, the general public, uh, uh, and to that general public, he only speaks in parables after Matthew 12. Within his followers, there's a group called the 70 that are singled out in the scriptures. Within the 70, there's the 12. All of us have know, know, know about the 12. Within the 12, there clearly are three that are his inner circle. And it's Peter, James, and John. Why are they in the inner circle? Well, they're the ones that were present at Jairus' daughter being raised from the dead. Those three were present at the transfiguration. Those three were in the, literally an inner circle at Gethsemane. And those three are joined by Andrew to make four to be at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. As we study the Gospels, we again and again and again see three disciples that are singled out as the inner circle, if you will. So that's uh, not just a tra tradition, that's in the Scripture, clearly. So Peter was one of the first disciples called. And he always stands first in any list of disciples. And uh, he also is probably the subject of more jokes about entering heaven that have nothing to do with the Bible. When you get to heaven, Peter isn't at the gate to screen you through as the, all these silly little stories that we, we hear. But, uh, but Peter is also one of the three who formed the inner circle around the Master, as I've just highlighted to you. And his impulsive devotion is so conspicuous and so colorful, he endears him to all of us. And again and again and again, it's Peter that seems to open his mouth just to change feet, because he's often saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And yet his impulsive devotion is colorful and enjoyable. But he often acts as the spokesman for the Twelve. You can go through a whole list of references where it's Peter that seems to be the one that speaks up. So he seems to have a natural gift of leadership, at least in the, in the vocal sense. And uh, it's at that crisis at Caesarea Philippi that he actually isn't just speaking for himself. He's articulating for the whole band. For the question was directed to all of them. And uh, all are included in the look that, that reprimand, subsequent reprimand has. Now, this, the transfiguration which immediately follows is intimately related to that confession that precedes it. And uh, the experience of the transfiguration made a very lasting impression on Peter, and he alludes to it again and again in his letters. So we want to be sensitive to that. Now, we all know the story of his denials. Jesus said that you'll, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times, and three times are recorded in the Scripture, where he's confronted in the confusion following Gethsemane. Everybody's frightened and running. He's hanging around, and they recognize him. Three, three, different, three different incidents where he denies that he's a disciple. In fact, he even swears that he's not, finally, 
in Matthew 26, 74. I didn't bother digging out those scripts. I think that's well known enough to most of you. You may not realize that in denying him, he lost his discipleship. Not suggesting he lost his salvation, but he apparently lost his discipleship. Why do I say that? Well, when you get to Mark 16, and the resurrection has taken place, and they're at the empty tomb, and entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man, an angel apparently, sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. We always read this around Easter time, don't we? It's part of the resurrection story. But notice verse 7. This angel apparently says, But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter. That's a strange phrase. Tell his disciples and Peter. Doesn't the word disciples include Peter? Apparently not at that moment. Tell his disciples and Peter. Then he goes before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. Peter is singled out for a special resurrection visibility, by the way. Now, he lost his discipleship when he denied, but he, he's going to get reinstated. The point I want to highlight as we go along here, discipleship can be lost. Salvation cannot be, because your salvation is 100% derives from Christ's completed work. But the rewards that are available to you for faithfulness can be forfeited by failure to be faithful. So discipleship can be lost, salvation cannot. Discipleship depends upon the faithfulness of the believer. No surprise? I want to underscore that as we go here. Let's look where he gets reinstated. You, go, you pop over to John 21. This is that morning that they're all up in Galilee. After the resurrection, he told them to wait up there. And they, they, they're take, they, they fish all night, can't catch anything. Jesus he invites them to put their net on the other side of the boat. And of course, it's... They get plenty, and so he invites them to breakfast. So they come ashore. And when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said to him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time. When he did this the third time, if nothing else, it would sink into Simon. He's giving him three. He denied him three times. He's giving him three chances to, re to, to correct that. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said, the third time then, Jesus says, feed my sheep. Very familiar reinstatement of Peter's discipleship. Not his, his, his salvation hasn't been lost. He, that, was, that was his discipleship. And then Jesus continues, says, Verily I say unto thee, when thou hast, wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. So he's reinstated. And so son, Simon, son of Jonas, that was his natural name that Jesus uses. First time, do you agape me? And Peter says, you know, I phileo you. Second time, Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And the second time, Peter says, you know, Lord, that I phileo you. Third time, Jesus meets him on his own ground. Son of Jonah, phileo me, you know that I do, and so forth. It's interesting much can be made of the different Greek verb here, agape being the most committed uh, unconditional commitment kind of expression. Phileo being a, a, uh, an affectionate but lesser degree of commitment. Now, it's interesting to contrast 
Peter's rhetoric in the Gospels with his incredibly skillfully crafted sermons in Acts 2 and Acts 3. There are two ser- first and second sermon. First sermon was in Acts 2, second sermon was in Acts 3. When you study those sermons, and we won't take the time here, but it is astonishing to see how different, how skillful, how articulate, how crisp, how well organized those are. In contrast to these kind of bumbling, enthusiastic fishermen. The Holy Spirit. The difference being Holy Spirit given in Acts chapter 2. There's other parallelism, parallelisms in Acts. The parallel between this letter, 1 Peter, and Peter's sermons recorded in Acts are very significant. It shouldn't surprise us. 1 Peter 1.20 is almost identical with Acts 2.23. 1 Peter 4.5 with Acts 10.42. But even more striking are the examples between 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, which we'll deal with in the future, and Acts 4, 10 to 11. Because in each passage, Psalm 118, verse 22, is quoted and applied to Christ, the stone which the builders rejected, and so on. It's interesting that Peter was present when Christ himself used Psalm 118, verse 22, to refer to his rejection by the Jewish leaders. The, builder which the, the stone which the builders refused to become the headstone of the corner. A very famous, familiar verse to you from Psalm 118.22. Jesus applies it to himself, and Peter then uh, picks up on that. The, Peter is especially marked out at the message of the resurrection. Tell the disciples and Peter, see he's, he's focused on um, and personally receives a visitation of the risen Lord. In Luke 24 and also 1 Corinthians 15, there's a recap of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. And in each of those lists, there was a special appearance to Peter. We don't, it's not recorded other than that it happened. But Peter received a very special visit from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Peter's ministry was to the circumcised. That confuses many people because in Acts chapter 10, it's Peter, it's through Peter that the door to the Gentiles was opened with Cornelius and all that going on in Acts 10. But that doesn't mean that it's Peter's job then to be the minister to the Gentiles. Paul is assigned that. And I want to clear up that as we go. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul writes, verse 7, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, Paul teaching us, writing here, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. In other words, Paul took the Gentiles, Peter took the Jew. That was their way they did, not exclusively, but that's their focus, okay? For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleships of the circumcision, the same was mighty in, in me toward the Gentiles. Paul writing here. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that grace was given unto me, Paul justifying himself, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So you need to understand that many people get confused in the New Testament. Paul felt that was his mandate. He wished it was the other way around. He we had a heart for the Jews, but he, his job, he understood, was to go to the Gentiles. Peter, in contrast, his primary mission is, of course, to the Jew. And that's important to understand because who, to whom is Peter writing this letter? You'll discover he's writing to Jewish, the Jews in the diaspora. Every biblical, doctrine in, 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 every biblical doctrine is exemplified in the life of Peter. The two natures, the, 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 the spirit and the flesh. The two births, born again. Are going to, the, the, the change in Peter when he's born again. The old guy was Simon. That was the natural guy in all its carnality. The new guy is Peter, the rock. The old man, the new man. Old Simon, new Peter. The old man, Christian life, but mere salvation, discipleship, but still a carn, a carn what we think of as a carnal Christian. In contrast to a spiritual life, eternal life, life abundant and un, un, uncontested. Now we're going to discover that in our lives there's inconsistencies. Are we surprised? Apparent contradictions in our own life. Same thing with Peter. All his life he remained both Simon and Peter. We war against the world, 
the flesh, and the devil. The world we can define and deal with. Satan you can resist and deal with. The flesh doesn't go away. We fight that battle to the end, to the death, at the, uh, to, our, to, our, uh, to, to the end of our life, I should say. Now, before Pentecost, it's Peter who takes the lead in the community in Acts chapter 1 and so forth. He's the principal preacher. He's the spokesman before the Jewish authorities in chapter 4. Presiding in the administration of discipline in chapter 5. Ananias, Sapphira, and all that business. Though the church as a whole made a deep impression on the community, it was to Peter in particular that supernatural powers were attributed. So he has a very lead role in the early chapters of Acts. In Samaria, which follows after Jerusalem and Samaria and then the uttermost parts of the earth. In Samaria, the church's first mission field is Samaria. The same leadership is exercised, chapter 8 and so forth. And, and also Philip. It's significant that the first apostle be associated with the Gentile mission, and that unmistakably by providential means. He didn't open it. God opened the door to the Gentiles. He chose to do it through, through Peter. So it wouldn't look like Paul's contrivance, you follow me? Peter was the one that God used to open that door. Now this immediately brings criticism upon Peter, and not for the last time. Later on up at Antioch, that was the first church that had a significant Gentile or pagan element. He shared table fellowship with the Gentile converts, but when a bunch of Jewish Christians showed up, he withdraws and plays the role of a Jew. He had liberty in Christ when the Jews weren't around, but when the Jews showed up, he starts keeping the Torah and all that. And Paul calls him down for this. This was roundly denounced by Paul. Now, that, that does not mean there's any theological difference between them. Paul is criticizing his hypocrisy in terms of he has freedom in Christ, but he's denying it when his Jewish fr friends are around. And so it's the incompatibility of Peter's practice with his theory that Paul is calling him down for. It's all discussed in, in Galatians 2. And Peter will acknowledge all of this in his letter, by the way, that Paul, he, Paul, Peter will speak of Paul's letters as Scripture. I want to emphasize that because many Messianic Christians tend not to listen to Paul because they can't quite compute, doesn't quite meet some of the presuppositions. No, Paul's letters are regarded by Peter as, gospel, uh, as, as Scripture. Anyway, moving on. Paul's gospel... And Peter's had the same content, although they express it a little differently. There's no variance between um, the, uh, 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 Paul and Peter. And, uh, so, and the Gentile mission had no truer friend than Peter. They're not divided in their missions here at all. Peter's speeches in Acts and Mark's gospel and 1 Peter have the same theology of the cross rooted in the concept of Christ as the suffering servant. He was already with the right hand of fellowship, recognizing mission to the Jews and Paul's to the Gentiles as part of the same ministry. At Jerusalem, at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, Peter's recorded as the first to urge the full acceptance of Gentiles on faith alone. So Peter's not an anti-Gentile advocate. Quite the contrary. He's a, he's a friend of the Gentiles. Peter's career after the death of Stephen is very hard to, to trace. There's all kinds of conjectures. There are references to him in Joppa, Caesarea, and elsewhere that seem to imply that he undertook missionary work in the Palestinian area. And uh, James, no doubt, has assumed the leadership in Jerusalem. There's no question about that because of Acts 15 and some other reasons. The early church fathers make that very clear. Peter was imprisoned in Jerusalem, and on his miraculous escape, he left for another place, as it's recorded in Acts. All kinds of scholars have all kinds of guesses but attempts to identify what the other place was are fruitless, inconclusive. We do know that he did go to Antioch because of Galatians 2. He also may have gone to Corinth, but he probably not for very long. He's closely associated with the Christians in North Asia Minor. And some even conjecture that Paul's prohibition in entering Bithynia was due to the fact that Peter may have been at work up there. But that's a conjecture. 
Peter's residence in Rome has been disputed, but not on sufficient grounds. First Peter was certainly written from Rome. First Peter 5 will deal with that. That book, First Peter, uh, shows signs of being written just before or during Nero's persecution. And a letter by First Clement 5 implies that, like Paul, he died in this outburst, but we don't know that for sure. There is an allusion in chapter 5 of the church at Babylon, and some people uh, feel that was a code name for Rome. Not so. Babylon uh, had a large Jewish constituency there. That's where the Babylonian Talmud was, was, uh, was penned itself. And it's, the, it's of the Talmudic documents, it's the authoritative one, not of Babylon. Not Rome. It's not a code name for Rome. It's Babylon. And uh, anyway, there's a story in a document called the Acts of Peter. That's a spurious uh, pseudonym thing. Um, of his, uh, his martyrdom by crucifixion, head uh, upside down. That uh, cannot be accepted as a reliable document, but it is possible it may have pre be preserving some valid traditions, but scholars are, are divided on that issue. The earliest statement about the origin of the Gospel of Mark is by Papias as the interpreter of Peter. This is recorded by Eusebius and also Irenaeus. What I'm getting at is here, the Gospel of Mark the second gospel of the four, is widely regarded by competent scholars as to be uh, really the words of Peter, that Mark was like his secretary. Mark was not a direct observer of Christ. He's very young at the beginning, but he does, he's very active in the subsequent ministry. And uh, he, there's lots of evidence that Mark was his amanuensis. He recorded for him. Very likely... The Gospel of Mark, where Mark's attempts to put in writing all that he learned traveling with Peter. So in a sense, it's regarded as Peter's Gospel. Okay. It's Mark's hand, but Peter's voice is one way to look at that. Okay. The nature of the incidents, the choice of the events, the matter that they're treated, all suggest that it's Peter's position that's being presented by young Mark. Well, okay, we've got the first Peter uh, letter in front of us. has three major divisions. Christian suffering and conduct in light of full salvation is the first couple of chapters. The believer's life in light of a sevenfold position. I won't get into the sevenfold position here, but we'll look at that as we get to chapter, into chapter 2 and 3 and 4. There's se we have seven positions in Christ, and each one has an impact on our lives. And then finally, chapter 5 will wrap up Christian service in the light of the coming of our chief shepherd. And the second letter of uh, Peter will be especially precious in view of our eschatological perspectives. Okay, so let's jump in and pick up some of this before we lose our hour here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, this is a bold statement of apostolic authority. It's supported both by internal evidence in the text and also by its early and universal acceptance as part of the canon of Scripture. There are many other documents in the New Testament that have some arguments about them. There are very few about this epistle. It's pretty clearly Peter's, a uh, lot of evidence of that, we don't have to beat that one to death. To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now those are Gentile regions, but to whom is this letter written? Okay. In accordance with the Lord's instructions, Peter seeks to feed the scattered sheep of the house of Israel. That's what he was charged to do. And his primary focus is to the scattered sheep of the house of Israel. Those are Jews in the diaspora. These areas that are listed here are areas that we, we consider here north of the place called Palestine and Syria and south of the Black Sea, the region you and I know as Turkey primarily. Asia Minor is a Roman provincial designation for a piece of geography that today bears the name pretty much of, of uh, is what we call Turkey. Scattered the, to the strangers, scattered throughout Pontus. The word scattered in the Greek is diasporus. 
It has a special meaning to the Jewish Christians in those churches. The diaspora referred to Jews who were separated from their homeland. And this is a term used here well in advance of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That's still forthcoming. Because uh, uh, James is still alive. He gets killed in 62. So this is in the first, you know, couple of decades of, of, of the church history here. Continuing verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit under the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace, and be multiplied. Now, if we were making a career of, of this, we could spend hours on this verse because each one of these phrases is a springboard to very, very profound theological issues. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, we've had some background on that already. I'll touch on it here in a minute, but we will also be dealing with it further as we get later in this chapter and in the subsequent chapters. The concept of election in both the Old Testament and New Testament, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, elect, election, choose, chosen are essentially synonymous. To choose of either divine or human choices, those same terms are used. But we are encountering here a paradigm of divine volition, God's own will. Why? Because he, first of all, has foreknowledge. From that foreknowledge, he can do an election, and that election will result in a predestination. Uh, foreknowledge determines election, in other words. Predestination brings to pass the election, and election looks back to foreknowledge. In other words, that which is elected is taking advantage of God's foreknowledge. But that, that election... Um, uh, it brings to pass the predestination. And all of that, of course, looks forward to destiny. Those are the Greek terms. It's actually not a problem when you look at, when you realize that you're dealing here with, by the acts of someone who's outside the constraints of time, inhabits eternity. So he knows in advance what's going to happen. So that foreknowledge allows him to elect, which causes it predestined destiny to take place. So that should take the mystery out of those terms, but there are some formidable issues that emerge there that we've talked about in the past. There's corporate election, Israel was chosen, and the church. Do you realize there's no other nation on the planet Earth that was chosen? You can list all the nations on the planet Earth, 70 of them as listed in, in, the, in the, the table of nations of Genesis 11. Only one, that was, only one chosen by God was Israel. The other corporate designation is the church. Elements, of course, from the other 70 nations. There's also divine election in the individual sense, according to the foreknowledge of God, as, as mentioned here in the verse we just looked at. Holy of grace, not of human merit. Romans 9 and 11 hammer away on that. Whereby certain are chosen for himself. John 15 and other passages. And some people are chosen for very specific, distinctive service. Peter was chosen to minister to the lost sheep of Israel. Continuing, uh, uh, through the sanctification of the Spirit. Wow, we could talk a lot about that. Let's keep it simple. Let's talk about the paradigm of salvation. Just briefly, this is by review for most of you. I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. You can say that simultaneously. Earl Rademacher likes to mention all three to confuse people. And what is he talking about? The past tense of, uh, of salvation that we call justification. That's a gift of God of everlasting life received by faith alone in Christ alone. Christ did it all. All you have to do is just receive it. The present tense of salvation, that's past tense. Present tense of salvation is sanctification. That's a work in progress that involves the faith and the works of the believer. Each one of us in this room, in the sound of my voice, are works in progress. He is not finished with any of us. And yet there is a future tense of salvation, which typically we call glorification, and that's the result of the previous aspects. All believers will be glorified, resurrected, and given a body like Christ, but some will have more glory, more reward, that is, than others. That's what Romans 8 nails down, this, the certainty of your glorification. And that's what the book, whole book of Hebrews deals with. 
So we have three tense. Past tense, justification. Present tense, sanctification. Future. That's why in the, within the Institute, we discourage the use of the term salvation because it can mean many different things to different people. Specifically, if possible, you say justification, sanctification, glorification, and you'll eliminate a lot of confusion. Past tense, separation from the penalty of sin. Jesus did it all. We call it justification. Present tense, separation from the power of sin. If you're not a believer, you're under the bondage of sin. If you're a believer, you have the power to be free of that sin if you'll take advantage of it. That's called separating from the power of sin and sanctification. And that's a, we're, we're in a work in progress as we begin to understand and apply the tools that God has given us as believers. The future tense, separation from the very presence of sin. We call that, call that glorification. Penalty, power, Presence, past, present, and future. All three of these terms, justification, sanctification, glorification, are simply tenses, past, present, and future, of the word, the collective term we call salvation. Okay, justification is for us, sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous, sanctification makes the sinner righteous. When you accept Christ, you are declared justified. You haven't changed yet. But you're innocent before the bar of justice as far as God's concerned. Sanctification is the process that changes you. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin in your life. That's what it's all about. Well, continuing then, unto the obedience. Oh boy, there's that term. And sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Word obedience, hupakoi, to hear uh, to, to hear under, to hearken. It's man's responsibility to be submissive to God's Word. Who's in control? God is. We need to remember that. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. One living in obedience is constantly being cleansed with Christ's blood and is thus set apart from the world. Sprinkling the blood of Christ. That's the what's implied in this. And all these things will be amplified later, so I don't want to you know, spend too much time on it in this stage. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. Ooh, there's an interesting phrase. Born again. I thought that came out of John 3. Well, it comes out of a lot of places, but it has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has given us a new birth. You didn't do anything to get it. He gave it to you if you'll accept it. People can do nothing to merit such a gift. It is a gift, not, not an earning. Now, the, 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 the words that translate that from the verb beget again or cause to be born again, it's used twice in the New Testament, both times in this very chapter of Peter's. Has begotten us again into a lively hope. Easy word, but very pregnant with meaning here. The lively hope is based on a living, resurrected Christ. You're going to discover Peter is continually uh, obsessed with the resurrection life, the resurrection power that's available to the believer. The lively hope is based on the living, resurrected Christ, and it's going to be amplified when we get to verse 21 of this same chapter. He used the word living, Peter used the word living six times in this letter. It's a hope that's alive. And here the living emphasizes the believer's hope is sure, it's certain, it's real, as opposed to the deceptive, empty, or false hope of the world offers. Very different, very real, very tangible to the extent that it's expressed in our joy. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. To an inheritance, ah, that's a different kind of thing here. The sure hope is of a future inheritance, claronomia. The same word is used in the Septuagint to refer to Israel's promised possession of the land. D did Israel inherit the land? Only by taking it. Same thing with inheritance. And we're going to talk much more about that as we get into this further. See, the, Israel's possession of land was their possession granted to her as a gift from God. The inheritance, in that sense, is a gift too. 
but it won't have any meaning unless you take you accept it and faithfully. What's your most precious possession? Interesting question. I should have you fill in the paper on that. What's your most precious possession and why? And more importantly, what have you done with it? What are you doing with your precious possession? But now, Peter does a strange thing with three words here. He takes three words, each beginning with the same letter and ending with the same syllable to describe a cumulative fashion this, this inheritance, is, the, the permanence of this. Incorruptible, it can never perish is what it means, apathartos. Undefiled, that's amiatos, unspoiled in other words. And that fadeth not away, that's amaratos. In each case, it's a TOS kind of sound that closes the word to give it a, a phonetic connectivity here. Can never perish, never spoil, never fade, is what he's saying. It's reserved in heaven for you. It's interesting how Peter, the, the craftsmanship that shows up here, I think that's interesting. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last days. How are these things kept? The word kept there is not, it's not only guarded, but heirs who have been born into that inheritance are shielded by God's power. Ferrero is the root word here. It's a military term. To guard, protect by a military guard is the thought here. And uh, we kept by the power of God through faith and his salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. The final step or ultimate completion of the salvation of our souls that he's going to talk about in verse 9 of the series will come when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's a clause that Peter uses twice again after this. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Are we in heaviness for manifold temptation? I think so. We might use those words in our vocabulary, but we're facing heavy times. And yet we, should, we are to greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, and so on. Wherein do ye greatly rejoice? Wherein? He's linking this to the truths that were mentioned in the previous three verses. Because of those three verses, you greatly rejoice. Knowledge alone cannot produce the great joy of experiential security and freedom from fear in the face of persecution. It's important you not only to know what you have, you need to rejoice in it, you need to express it. That's, that's, that should be the uh, result of your faith, is to greatly rejoice. God's omnipotent sovereignty needs to be coupled with human responsibility, is the point. It's a courtship. Faith makes theological security experiential. You shouldn't just know these things. You should be experiencing them. The joy should come forth. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, like gold is, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Tried by fire. That's a, the Greek term there, is a, it means to test for purposes of approving. That's what you do with gold. You, you melt it to get it pure. That's exactly what happens to your felt. It, it puts under stress to purify it. The dokuminion is trial in verse 7 and also in James 1.3 and dokuminion is to test in James 1.3. These are related terms, obviously. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is glorified by your faithfulness. You have an opportunity to glorify Jesus Christ. How? By being faithful and allowing that faith to be tested by trials. These trials then yield two results. They refine or purify one's faith, much as gold is refined by fire when dross is removed. I assume you're familiar with that process. Trials also prove the reality of one's faith. Stress deepens and strengthens the Christian faith and lets its reality be displayed. People are watching. People observe more than you realize. Your faithfulness is your way to magnify the name of the Messiah. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though ye see him not, yet believing, he rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Wow! 
whom having not seen, ye love. It's all about Jesus. It's all about loving him. And having not seen, ye love. In whom, though ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Those are wild words. The climax of the joy that results from faith. The focus of a believer's faith is not on abstract knowledge, but on the person of Christ. But all of us, I think, have read books or encountered people who are articulate, eloquent. They have soaring words, profound expressions. That all sounds good, but it doesn't rattle when you shake it. We've also seen people, you can just tell, have experienced the person of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Remember the letter to the Ephesians in, in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, the first of the seven letters. Boy, they were sharp. They'd done their homework. They, they tried the apostles and said they were and were not and found them liars. Boy, they were sharp. They knew their theology. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, he says. They're so busy on the business of the king, they had no time for the king. You lost your first love. It's about loving Christ. It's about loving Christ, not memorizing Bible verses, etc. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Receiving out of all of this the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Receiving the end. You and I can rejoice because we are receiving. That's present tense, continuing. It's not a past tense thing. It's not a forward hope. No, no. It's a present tense experience. To receive as a reward. We have that today. What was promised? What was promised? Salvation. The goal, which is the goal or telos, the end of your faith. For those who love and believe in Jesus Christ, salvation is past. He's given us a new birth. A justification. Present through faith, you are shielded by God's power. That's an expression of sanctification. And the future it is their inheritance of glorification, which will be revealed in the last time. The goal of your faith. The past tense was in verse 3, the present tense in verse 5, the future in 4, 5, and 9 is the goal. So the structure is latent in those six verses we just reviewed. But that's about as far as we'll have time for in this Initial session, chapter 1 is a longer session, so we do well to, uh, we'll review this slightly in next session, but then wrap up chapter 1 in the next session. So I encourage you for your next session, study carefully chapter 1. And use what study time you have between now and the next session to review at your own leisure your favorite episodes about Peter. Walking on the water, with Christ, you, 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 as you go through your Gospels, you flip through those, you'll find uh, each one of us will f discover a favorite episode where he has to pay taxes by finding a coin and a fish or whatever. Colorful, colorful stories. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.